What's he really like? There's such an incredible amount of misunderstanding of who God is out there. People take the extremes. He's either so, he's more like a Santa Claus where everything's okay and he's just there for the gifts. To the other extreme where he's some kind of a sadistic uh, monster that is only there to punish you. And it's just so incredibly wrong and so incredibly unbiblical in both of those cases that uh, over the last uh, 35 years of following Christ, I've um, I've just had this adventure of finding out who he is and what he's like. And one of the one of the most profound times of my life happened around 25 years ago when I first heard a structured message by a brother on the Father Heart of God, and it so grabbed me that I determined at that point that if I were given the, the opportunity, I would uh, in fact teach this particular message. And uh, I am so blessed to be able to do it. This past weekend, as we gathered together, we had young people between the ages of 18 and 30 from a number of different places, uh, all from within here in um, Lindale, Tyler area of Texas. Uh, but there were people were from a variety of places originally. We had one young lady in particular who was from Nigeria, another young lady who had was born and raised right in this area, never been much farther than uh, Dallas, Texas in her, whole, in her whole life. We had folks there from Canada. We had folks from all over the place. It, it was really fun being with them and sharing with them. And the thing that, that really impacted me this weekend was just how gentle and kind our father is. And let me tell you a story about one of the young ladies that was there. Her name was Fiona. Fiona was the young lady who was from Nigeria. When Fiona came into the uh, the retreat center, uh, we we just kind of made some light contact together, and I and I, as I observed her, I knew she was a, a young lady, but her face showed many years of of wear and tear, as it would be. And I thought to myself, boy, I, I wonder what she's gone through. And uh, over the weekend, as I was teaching, I would glance over at her and see her, and boy, at times it seemed like she was really, really struggling, and other times it just seemed like her, her complete countenance was closed off, and I just, I was really burdened for her, and uh, I didn't know her background, I just knew that she was from Nigeria, and was thrilled that she was there. On Sunday morning when we were closing up our time and getting ready to share communion, I was talking about the power of forgiveness and how when we walk in with a heart of forgiveness, our Heavenly Father is able to use us in ways we can't even imagine. And she was really struggling. I could tell she was really struggling. And so as we began to pray and various individuals in the retreat were just kind of processing and praying through some people that they needed to forgive and situations they needed to present to the Lord, I went towards her and sat down and I said, Fiona, let's talk. What do we need? What do you need to pray through? And uh, she began to relate her story of how she grew up in Nigeria in a large family, large extended family, uh, over 80 some odd people in the family and the majority of them being Muslims. But her father and mother had converted to Christ when they were young. And uh, as a family, they were raised as Christians. But every time they gathered with their extended family, there was also always ridicule and laughter, making making fun of them. And it was very, very difficult. Many hurts, many verbal hurts that took place. And finally, in the last several years, it got very intense. So so intense that her cousins who were Muslims actually told her that they'd have no problem killing her because she is a Christian. And according to their understanding of the Quran, they would be doing a good thing. She had so much hurt in her heart. Not necessarily bitterness, but a lot of confusion and certainly room for, for bitterness to be developed in her heart. And she, uh, she said, I, I just, 
am so hurt by them. I don't know what to do. And so we began a time of prayer together, and I just encouraged her to consider each one of those cousins, consider what they had said in the past, those things that the Holy Spirit was bringing to mind, and just to forgive them and to make the choice that day to forgive them. And we prayed through for about 30 minutes or so regarding some of those issues, and I listened to her, and she forgave each one. She even went so far as to pray and forgive Islam for what it is. And uh, she looked up at me, and her eyes were clear, and her face was just filled with joy. She goes, I'm free. I'm really free. And again, it was a wonderful testimony to me of the power of forgiveness, but even more so was a wonderful testimony of how our Heavenly Father wants us to, to be like Him. And the whole power of forgiveness and the understanding that there is in our Heavenly Father that it, it, sometimes it's hard. I, I don't understand uh, where we get off track as it would be in our thinking sometimes that uh, we get become very legalistic in our perspective of who our Father is. Our Father's disposition is to forgive. It's not to judge. It's not to hurt. It's not to... I mean, I mean, the last thing God wants to do is judge. He wants to see folks reconciled. He's called us, all who call him Lord and Savior, he's called us to the ministry of reconciliation. And I wonder what happens to us, because here's a young lady who, over the years, had developed such deep hurts and anger, and she was set free on that morning, and, and it was wonderful, but what takes place in our lives? What is it that we wrestle with? And I came to the conclusion a while back as I was thinking about this, that even as a, as a culture, and particularly a, a, a younger generation, there's this cry for justice around the world, and I think part of the reason we, we cry for justice is because we are so aware of all the injustices that there are in the world, all the things that are wrong, partly because of the media, because the world has shrunk by way of our ability to communicate. Even tonight, our demonstration is, here we are, we're in the very far reaches, perhaps, of from one another and yet able to communicate. And so as I as I pondered this, I thought, you know, I don't think that what people are looking for is justice. I think it's a convenient word and it's a nice sounding word, but I think oftentimes people misunderstand justice with vengeance. And vengeance should have no place in the Christian's life. And we understand what vengeance has done throughout history. And we understand it even more clearly today that people who look for vengeance are able to find it, but oftentimes hurt deeply, hurt deeply, many, many people. And so where do we go? Where do we go to find a refuge, to find a place where we can find a restorative process in our life? If we've been hurt, if we've been uh, offended, if we've been embittered by certain things that have taken place in our life. And uh, you know what, guys? It's our Father. It's going back to our Father. And, and here's the thing that I, I'm i finding of great concern to me. I find it of great concern that many of us in the body of Christ today have great anger towards our leaders in this country. It scares me. It's a, it's, it's a dangerous thing to carry anger like that. It scares me when I find myself getting angry like that. But when we get angry like that, and it's not resolved, it's not prayed through, it's not carried to the cross, it's not forgiven as it would be, uh, we are planting seeds where bitterness can begin to grow. It's one of the things that concerns me the most right now. I, um, I'm i not pleased with the way things are in our nation or around the world. I'm, I'm deeply disturbed by the, the wholesale slaughter of human lives and of babies and of numbers of things like that. And as Lori could tell you, if she 
were to speak up, she'd, she'd tell you I'm a very passionate person. I feel very deeply on a number of things, and I have been known to get kind of emotional at times regarding some of them. But I have been so challenged in recent months by the Lord that because I feel passionate at least for something, that does not give me an excuse to lose control. Self-control is still to be a part of my life and a part of the discipline of being a Christian, particularly as it relates to those whom we have as leaders over us, whether it be at a national level, state, regional, or even a local level, particularly even within the context of the local church. So I, I'm, I'm very concerned about these things, and I want to see us be able to respond rightly to them. And I, I feel like we, we love the idea in the body of Christ. We love the idea about God the Father, and we, we love hearing about him. We love embracing him. We love going to him, but yet we hold him back too often in regards to allowing him to come in and touch those areas that are the uh, areas that are the greatest uh, need in our life. And there's a number of reasons that takes place. I had a young a young person this past weekend at the retreat who, when I was talking regarding regarding some of the challenges that there are in the body of Christ to reach out and to love people with the love of the Father, I mentioned to the to something to the effect of who will love the pedophile with the love of the Father because they need to be reached. And this one young man just began to break down and cry. And his past uh, afflictions, those things that have hurt him in the past, uh, included pedophilia. Someone had abused him. And I just and I and I just sat there and I thought, Lord, this is not an easy thing. I do not want to make light of it. And I I I do not want to make light of it in regards to this young man. But it is an area where we need to allow the Father to come and touch and to come and embrace and love and heal and restore. I don't have an easy answer for the issues of pedophilia in our culture. It is rampant, and uh, there are a number of reasons for it. But, uh, friends, if, if there's ever a cry that I would want to put out there for all of us, particularly for those of us who are called to prayer, to seeking God, uh, for the issues of our nation, Oh, that God would give us a strategy for reaching these people who have given themselves over to such debauchery and because uh, they need to be reached. They need to be reached. They are the lepers of our present time. So the question comes back to me uh, oftentimes as I'm talking with a young person or actually even older adults. Some of the most wounded people I've met in my life have been in their 50s and 60s carrying wounds that have gone back 30, 40, sometimes 50 years. And uh, the question often comes, you know, does, does God really care for me as a Heavenly Father? Does He really? And I can sit and I can express it and I can share with them, even as I'm sharing with you tonight, with as much empathy as I can put in my voice and as much passion and compassion and all the other things that would be part of a communication process with them. But really, the final thing goes back, well, let's see what the Word of God says. What does the Word of God say regarding our Heavenly Father? If we take a closer look at it. And I'm sure for many of you, since you are called to the ministry of intercession, to reaching out, you have probably come across these many scriptures. And if these are scriptures that you yourself are familiar with, and I pray that it would be an encouragement and an affirmation to you tonight. But I know for me that as I looked over the scriptures over the years, these have held special meaning to me as I share them with you. And the first one is found in 1 Peter 5, 7. That really begins to speak about our Heavenly Father's uh, real concern for us. In 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter relates that God wants to carry our burden. He desires to help us. Peter says, casting our burdens upon him. I what an incredible what an incredible thing to think about that the burdens that we sometimes carry. 
not necessarily those that have been given to us by the Holy Spirit, but those that we have incurred as a result of our life. Those burdens are offered by the Holy Spirit to be taken and to be given to our Father. Casting our burdens upon him because he cares for us. He really does care. In Luke chapter 12, verse 7, I, I love this particular scripture because it says that God knows the very numbers of the hairs on our head. And if there is normally, if I'm teaching this and there's people in the audience who are balding a little bit, I thank them for making God's job a little bit easier. And uh, which normally I try to bring a little bit of humor to the moment because by this time normally in the teachings, things are pretty serious. But you know that the idea of God counting the hairs on our head, if we were to take just one square inch of our scalp and to begin to count the hairs uh, on them, we would find that there is perhaps literally hundreds and hundreds of hairs in that one area. And when we consider that, it says that God knows the very numbers of the hairs on our head. It speaks of God's intimate and um, unfailing understanding of the details, the little details of our life. One of the things that often happens with uh, with us as, as individuals is that we are convinced that uh, God's too busy to sweat the small stuff in our life. But in Luke chapter 12, I, I really believe that we can sit there and look at this and go, if he knows the very numbers of that, hairs on our head, he knows about those deep, those kind of details, which compared to some of the things that are going on in our life is really minuscule in comparison that we can look at this and go, oh my gosh, what an incredible, incredible God. He knows the very minute details of our life. He understands us. He understands the moments when we've been hurt. He understands the moments when we've had great joy. He understands the confusion and the frustration. He was there. He saw it. He was a part of our life at those times. Years ago when I was a very young boy, my father, who had suffered a great deal during World War II, he was spent three years in a German concentration camp, uh, my father was deeply affected by all of that. My father was a, a, a wonderful man. He gave his heart to Christ shortly, about a year after I did. And uh, But he had a lot of hurts as a result of being in those camps. And I remember when I was eight years old watching my father um, in the process of trying to discipline his favorite dog he actually lost control, and, and he ultimately ended up killing the dog. And I remember watching this take place. I remember the effect it had on my life. I was, I was deeply wounded by what I saw, and I was, the wounding was not so much by the violence that my dad committed, but by my inability to help my dad. I felt like I had failed him. I felt bad for the animal, but I felt even worse, and that there was my dad who I loved and adored, who had just gone through something that was totally broken over what had taken place. And I, for years, I carried that. For years, my inability to fix things would often bring about responses of anger at myself or at the thing that I was trying to fix. Sometimes I would even be in friendships and close relationships within my family. One time as my wife and I had gone to a retreat to spend time alone as a couple as well as to get counseling in some areas of our life, the counselor just kind of walked us through a process, a theophostic process. And in a moment of in a moment of time as I was praying one morning, the Lord gave me a vision of that moment in time when I was a little boy and I saw where Jesus was when all of that happened. And he was right behind me. He was right next to my shoulder. And he was weeping with me as a little boy because I couldn't fix it. 
I couldn't make it better. I couldn't I couldn't help my dad. And it was such a it was such a tremendous, tremendous point in my life when I got that revelation, when I got that understanding, because I saw how my father has been involved with me in both the good times and the bad times. He was there. He may have not been able to do anything, but he was there. And I think that one of the, the great uh, disasters, one of the great disasters that we have today is that Christian and non-Christians are struggling with the fact that they don't know if God's there. They don't know if he's walking with them in the struggles that they're having. They're wrestling with this. God, do you care? Are you there? Do you hear me? And, you know, part of the teaching that I give says that one of the names of God is El Rai. I, it's the God who sees me. He sees me. And I just, I just find it so tragic that we, we actually get to the places where we're going, gosh, we just we don't know if God sees us, if we're really right, if he's there, if he, if he cares, if he's concerned. He's aware of the very hairs on my head right now, all of them, if they're green. Since I'm getting older, I'm finding out more and more how much my God is aware, how much my Father cares for me, how much he looks over me. He still, and, he, and, and this is true for every one of us here tonight that are listening, tonight when you go to bed, he is going to be watching over you. He is going to be caring for you. He is still going to be tucking you in tonight. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, he's going to be waiting for you. Sometimes in the, in the, in the, in the absolute uh, seriousness of day-to-day life and all the, all the things that we have to do and have to have in place and got to take care of, whether it be our job, our families, our ministries, whatever it may be, all of that craziness that sometimes makes up our life, there's one thing that we must get back to an understanding of is the intimacy with which our Father wants to live our life with. He wants us to be as close to us as we'll allow him. As close as us to us as we will allow him. Recently, a young lady in the ministry here that I work with, who is one of the most gifted women I've ever seen administratively, she oversees the operations of our facility here. We have over 250 staff and ministries going on all over the place, and she's the operations director, and she's very, very good at what she does. And recently she came back from a trip to Mexico, and while she was there, when she arrived on the, you know, on the trip to Mexico, she had around 20 people that she was taking down there on a short-term missions trip. She found herself not able to sleep for several days. And her testimony is, is that one night as she was having this issue with insomnia, she went up on the roof of the house that she was staying in, and she just began to pray and, and said, God, I, I don't understand what's going on. Why, was, why can't I sleep? And she just quieted herself there, and then all of a sudden from the way down in the depths of herself, her spirit began to cry out, and she began to cry and weep. And she said she wept bitterly because there were things that had taken place over years and years and years of life that had hurt her so deeply. And she said she cried for almost two hours up there, just, just almost violently crying. When it was all done, the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm going to take you on a different part of the journey now. And from that day forward, this woman who had learned how to be very self-sufficient and very efficient in her ministry now says, I, I cannot start the day without at least two hours of being alone with my father. And as you watch her work, she used to spend hours in her office. Now she's walking all over our campus. And as she's walking, she's praying. And when she prays, she was telling me the other day, she goes, I am praying prayers that are so big, that are so scary. I would have never prayed them before, but I'm praying them now. And she goes, and I am looking with huge expectation 
for God to be answering them. It's a real change in her life. He is closer to her now than he has ever been. She is more aware of his presence. I think that's what her father wants. Our Father wants to let us know that He wants to be very, very close. Extremely close. Her prayers have changed from an exercise in a religious activity to the dynamic of a of a living reality with her relationship with God. So exciting to be around. So exciting to watch her as she walks and prays and seeks God and oh. Just a whole change. Her countenance for her whole life has changed. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 32 say to us that God is aware of our needs and he wants to meet them. He's aware of our needs and he wants to meet them. He not only is aware of the intimate details of our life, but he knows what you need. Wow. Need a pair of shoes? He's aware of that. Need a little rest? He's aware of that. I think for most of us who have known the Lord for a period of time, we've all come to that understanding and the conviction that he does care for even the most minute needs that we have in our life. But sometimes we're challenged. And I think that with the challenge is this, is the Holy Spirit says, really? How small a need are you willing to believe me for? How great a need are you willing to do? Um, Ed, please forgive yeah. me, but I see that we have somebody online that might need translation, and I okay. want to make sure that we do offer that to them. Um, let me see. Lourdes, you have just gotten on, I see. Um, would you like translation? Um, let me see. Nini, maybe you could ask her if she needs translation. Her name is Lourdes. Lourdes, uh, miramos que acaba de, de conectarse con nosotros y queremos preguntarle si necesita traducción. Lourdes, Lourdes Santillana, le estamos preguntando si necesita traducción o entiende bien el inglés. You know what, Nini, maybe we can ask if anybody at all needs translation and then, um, then O sea, alguna way. otra persona que está escuchando y quiere que se le traduzca al español puede deci uh, decirnoslo. I don't know. Let me see if Lourdes can hear us yet. I, Lourdes, can you hear us? ¿Nos escucha, Lourdes? Um, I wonder, I don't know whether she can't hear us yet. You know what, no I, I hate to interrupt because this is such a good teaching. Oh, Sulema, you have your hand up. Would you, um, would you like translation? Let, oh, wait, let me, uh, um, Sulema, you have your hand up. Would you like translation, honey? Oh, I'm not hearing you well. Sulema, I didn't hear you well. Can you repeat that, honey? Can you ask her, Mimi, whether she needs translation? Sulema, ¿necesita traducción? Sulema, ¿necesita que se le traduzca al español? You know what? Let's just do this, Mimi, since we have Lourdes on and it looks like Sulema has her hand raised. Let's just translate this the next part. And that way we don't have to stop any longer. We'll just translate the next part. Is that okay with you, Mimi? Yes. Okay. Okay. Jennifer, about how much longer uh do I have? Um, let me see. You know what, Ed? <laughs> um we usually try to finish up like sometime some uh with the teaching part sometime between seven, seven 
can then do a question and answer. But if you're feeling the Holy Spirit move you a little bit longer, you know, we don't want to interrupt. So. Very good. Very good. So, Mimi, will I hear you as you translate? Yes. Um, make it short. Make like about a sentence, and then I say it in sure. Spanish. Very good. Thank you. You bet. If I get if I start if I start preaching, Mimi, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. So Matthew chapter six verses twenty five through thirty two speak of God's care for the little needs in our life. Mateo capítulo dos. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the scripture? Certainly, Matthew chapter six, verses okay. twenty five through thirty two. Mateo capítulo seis, versículo veinticinco al treinta y dos. And it speaks very clearly of God's care for us in the smallest areas. Está hablando muy claro de lo que él le importamos a él en las más diminutas áreas. But the thing that I, I like too is in that within those verses is the understanding that God values us above all other parts of the creation. Las cosas que más me, me llama la atención a mí es al ver cómo le importamos las partes que a él le importan de, más de nuestra creación. I think that that's really important. Creo que esto es muy importante. Because one of the things that the enemy uses in our life una de las cosas que el enemigo usa en nuestras vidas is many attacks at us uno, muchos ataques en contra de nosotros that are intended to get us to believe we are of lesser value. Que están, uh, in, uh, que están lanzados a nosotros para hacernos creer que no valemos. His, really, his goal is to get us to not think that we are a son or a daughter, but an orphan. Su meta es hacernos creer que nosotros no somos hijos o hijas de Dios, sino que somos huérfanos. Many times, people that we minister to, muchas veces a las personas que ministramos, uh, are unable to receive it because they're walking in an orphan spirit. No pueden recibir la palabra porque están caminando en un espíritu de huérfanos. And between the enemy and life circumstances that has been reinforced for better parts of their life. Entre el enemigo y las, las circunstancias que han venido a nuestras vidas. And so there's a real desire by our Father to get us to be reminded, even through this scripture, that, we are, not, that we are not orphans, but that we are sons and daughters. El Padre nos está diciendo en esta escritura que no somos huérfanos, somos sus hijos e hijas. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse en Jeremías, 11. En Jeremías capítulo 29, verso 11. Uh, the scripture there says, La escritura dice, For I know the thoughts that I have towards you, saith the Lord. Yo conozco los planes que tengo para ti, dice el Señor. Thoughts of good and not of evil. Planes de bien y no de mal. To bring you a future and a hope. Para traerte un futuro y una esperanza. Have we ever considered the, the fact that throughout the day, God is mindful of us? Considera que durante el día, Dios está pensando en nosotros. And he's, and he's thinking good thoughts towards us, even right now. Hablando buenas palabras para nosotras. So my, my question has often been. My, mi pregunta uh, diariamente ha sido. And maybe it's part of being a, a guy who's just trying to figure things out. Tal vez será una cosa mía de tra tratar de figurar las cosas. How many thoughts can God think a second? ¿Cuántas, cuántas, um, uh, cosas Dios puede pensar en un segundo? And could God possibly think good thoughts so, to, to every man, woman, and child on the earth every second? Posiblemente Él puede pensar buenos pensamientos para cada uno uh, de nosotros por segundo. Cada well, segundo. I, I did a, bit, a little bit of research. Yo he hecho un poquito de um, encuestas. 
And you know what I found out? I found out that that there's a, a, a crystal in the world that vibrates over 9 billion times a second. He encontrado que hay un cristal sobre nuestra nación que tiene um, 9 mil millones. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. There's a there there is a crystal, a piece of you know, a piece of crystal. Un pedazo de cristal. And it vibrates. Que vibra. Nine billion times a second. Nueve billones de veces por segundo. Now God is obviously greater than His creation. Obviamente Dios es aún mejor que esa creación. So that means God created that crystal to vibrate nine billion times a second. Eso quiere decir que Dios formó este cristal que que lata nueve billones de veces por segundo. Which probably means that God can at least think nine billion times a second. Probablemente esto significa que Dios piensa nueve nueve billones de veces por segundo. Which, if you use the nine billion, si usted usa los nueve billones, and compare it to the seven and a half billion people in the world, y los y los compara con los billones de gente de de población en este mundo, that means that God can think a good thought towards every man, woman, and child in the world. Every second. Eso quiere decir que Dios está pensando buenos pensamientos por cada persona en es, las nueve millones de personas en ese mundo. Which tonight, I'm just looking at the list of names here. Esta noche Roger, solamente estoy mirando a los nombres de personas aquí. And I'm looking at David and Kathy. Estoy mirando a David y a Kathy. There, oh gosh, there goes. God just thought a good thought towards David and Kathy sí. both. El Señor acaba de estar pensando buenos pensamientos sobre Kathy y David. Oh, there's a good thought for Jennifer. Oh, también buenos pensamientos sobre de Jennifer. There's a there's a good thought for Jenny. Para Jenny. And oh, there's a good thought for everybody who's on this list. Every oh, second. Y para cada persona que estamos en esta lista. So you, you see the the idea is here we have a father who is extravagant in his love for us. Puedes ver que nuestro padre es extravagante en pensar sobre nosotros. And it's amazing to me that we find ourselves so willing to forget that sometimes. Es es increíble pensar que nosotros nos olvidamos de eso en ocasiones. And you know, it's in those crisis moments when, los momentos we, de crisis, when we doubt his love, even for just a moment, cuando dudamos de su amor, aunque sea por un minuto, that God wants us to recognize, please don't misinterpret me. Dios quiere que nosotros reconozcamos. It's a, it, and it, you know, the enemy works very, very hard que el enemigo trabaja muy arduamente to get us to doubt God. para que nosotros lleguemos a dudar del Señor, de Dios. And all he's looking for is just one second y todo lo que está esperando es solamente un segundo of doubt. De, de duda to try and put his foot in the door of our life. para que él trate de poner su pie en, en la puerta de nuestra vida. So that he can bring accusation. Para que pueda traer acusaciones. God loves us, my friends. Amigos, Dios nos ama. Far more than we realize. Mucho más de lo que nosotros comprendemos. An evangelist from back in the late 1800s. Un evangelista en los uh, tiempos de 1800s. Said that in his conversion experience. Dijo que la, um, en la experiencia de su conversión that God poured out wave upon wave upon wave of his love for that man. Que Dios puso, um, um, what is that word? Lay? No, wave. It's like oh. an ocean wave. Que Dios trajo oh, ondas y ondas de amor por este hombre. 
And it got to the place where he even cried out and said, God, I can't take anymore. Please stop. Él llegó hasta el momento en que dijo, Dios, ya no puedo tomar más de tu amor. Por favor, para. Now, for all of us who may be online, if we have children, we understand what it means to want to show love abundantly todos, to our kids. Los, to, todos los que estamos ahorita en, en esta línea de internet, que estamos escuchando este mensaje, y tenemos hijos, creo que nos, todos queremos llegar el momento de enseñarle a nuestros hijos el amor que les tenemos. Imagine what it feels like for our Heavenly Father. Imagínate lo que se es para cómo siente nuestro Padre Celestial. He loves the entire world. Él conoce a todo el mundo. Every man, woman, and child. Cada hombre y cada mujer. But many of them won't receive his love. Pero muchos no pueden recibir o no quieren recibir su amor. The grief that it brings to his heart has got to be incredible. La tristeza que trae al corazón de Dios debe de ser increíble. You know, one of the things that I uh, experienced over the years Una was, de las cosas que yo he experimentado a través de los años has been um, disappointment. I'm sure all of us have had disappointment in our life. Ha sido muy difícil y estoy seguro que todos hemos tenido desacuerdos en nuestras vidas, desilusiones. And I want to I want to share just a, a real brief story with you that relates Quiero to the consequences of disappointment. Quiero compartirte una historia que se re relaciona con las desilusiones. Years ago in St. Croix, a young lady came to work at our ministry center there. Unos años pasados en San Croix, una joven vino a trabajar en nuestro ministerio. And when she came, y cuando ella vino, it was very obvious that she had the gifting and the anointing of God on her to work with children. Era muy obvio ver el, la unción que ella tenía para trabajar con los niños. She was very effective. Ella muy afectuosa. And uh, it came about Christmas time. Vino alrededor del tiempo de la Navidad. And It was a policy of the ministry that everybody go home for Christmas. Era un una póliza, no, era una orden o un um everybody would go home for Christmas. Todos en ese tiempo todos se iban a a la casa para el tiempo de Navidad. She went home. Ella fue a su casa. She had a nice time. Tuvo muy buen tiempo. She came back. Vino de regreso. And about two months after she had returned, Yo, dos meses de después de que ella había regresado, she came to the leadership of the ministry. Vino al liderazgo de la, de la administración. And she said, I'm going to have to leave. Y dijo, tengo que retirarme. She said, because I'm pregnant. Dijo que estaba embarazada. And we were shocked. Estábamos sorprendidos. And we asked her, well, what, when did this happen? What, what's going on? Le preguntamos qué estaba pasando, cuándo había sucedido. And when she had been home over Christmas, an old boyfriend came and visited. Ella dijo que cuando estaba en la temporada de, de Navidad, de vacaciones de Navidad en su casa, su novio había venido a verla. And one thing led to another. Y una cosa llegó a la otra. They spent a couple of evenings together. Pasaron juntos unas uh, tardes. And now she was going to have to go home. Y ahora ella tenía que regresar a su casa. When I heard the story, Cuando escuché la historia, I was very disappointed. Estaba muy desilusionado. But I had a question. Pero tenía una pregunta. Who gave the young lady permission to ¿Quién do le dio a, ¿Quién le dio a esta joven mujer permiso? To do what she knew she should not do. Para hacer lo que ella, ella sabía que no debería hacer. I've asked that question many times of young me, people in our culture. Yo me pregunté, me pregunto esta pregunta sobre muchos jóvenes de nuestra cultura. 
And they all sit there and say, well, she gave herself permission to do it. Ellos dicen, ella misma se dio el permiso para hacerlo. And that's correct. Y eso está correcto. But what, what was it that allowed her to make that kind of a decision? ¿Qué fue lo que ella la llevó a hacer esa decisión? And what it came down to was this, is, is it got down to the, her concept of who God her father was. Ella llegó a la conclusión de quién el padre es. And what it, what it amounts to is this, is that she knew that God loved her. Y ella sabía que Dios la amaba. But she was at a place in her understanding of God that she needed to have an awareness not only of the love of the Father, but the fear of the Lord as well. Okay, that was too long. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. She needed to have not just a revelation of the Father. Ella, no necesit ella necesitaba la revelación del Padre. But she needed a revelation of the fear of the Lord as well. Pero te, te necesitaba la revelación del temor de Dios también. Because, and, and the reason I say this, Porque la razón que yo digo esto, is because as passionate as I am concerning my father's love, es porque tan apasionado que yo estoy sobre el amor que el Padre me tiene a mí, I must always remember that he is also the God of the universe. Yo también tengo que entender que es el Padre del universo. And he is not to be trifled with. Y él no es alguien con que debemos jugar. And I, I, I want us to think for a moment back on the scriptures in John chapter 8. Quiero que pensemos uh, sobre la escritura en, de Juan capítulo 8. And Jesus is dealing with the woman who has been caught in adultery. Que está hablando sobre la mujer que fue uh, descubierta en el acto de adulterio. And as, as he is working with that whole, as he's speaking into that whole situation. Así como él está hablando sobre toda esta situación. He finally says to the woman, woman, where are y, your accusers? Finalmente le dice a la mujer, ¿dónde están los que te acusaban? And she says, Lord, there are none. Y ella dijo, no hay ninguno. And then Jesus says, neither do I accuse or condemn you. Y Jesús le dijo, yo tampoco te acuso ni te condeno. And th but then he says this. Pero dijo esto. Go and sin no more. Ve y no peques más. Or in other words, I forgive you. En otras palabras, te perdono. But don't do it again. Pero no lo vuelvas a hacer. There was in that demonstration, in that moment, a demonstration of the Father's love. En ese momento fue una demostración del amor del Padre. And at the same time, there's no compromise. Don't, don't think you can just get away with this. Y al mismo tiempo fue como comprometerla y, de, y que decirle no lo vuelvas a hacer. I think it is one of the great weaknesses we have in the body of Christ today. Creo que son una de las debilidades que hay en el cuerpo de Cristo hoy. And it's because we have an improper understanding of the Father's love. Y es porque no, lleva, no eh, hemos llegado a comprender el amor del Padre. And recognizing that God is now also the governor of the universe. Y no hemos reconocido que Él también es el Dios del universo. And He is not to be trifled with. Él, es, él no es para que, él, um, para que juguemos con Él. Now, years ago when I was a young Christian, años pasados cuando yo era un joven cristiano, um, a man who was discipling me, este hombre que me estaba discipulando, uh, one day told me, he gave me, he gave me a, a Bible concordance. Un día me, me dio una concordancia de la Biblia. Uh, a stack of paper, <laughs> un alto de papeles, and a pen, y una pluma. And he said, "I want you to write out every scripture in the Bible on the fear of the Lord." Y me dijo, quiero que escribas todas las escrituras que se refieren al temor de Jehová. I spent about six to seven hours a day for three yo, days. 
Yo do pasé de seis a siete horas al día por tres días. We didn't have computers back in those days. No teníamos computadoras entonces. But the result of it was Pero los resultados fueron about 38 to 40 pages of scriptures written out como 38 o 40 uh, hojas de papel escritas that all speak of the fear of the Lord. que todas hablaban sobre el, el temor de Jehová. But more importantly, pero más importante, I, I began to see as I wrote out the scriptures, yo empecé a ver como cuando yo escribía las escrituras, all of the incredible applications of the fear of the Lord. Las increíbles aplicaciones del temor de Jehová. And you know, when I got done, there were 62 applications of the fear of the Lord. Sabes que cuando yo terminé, encontré 62 aplicaciones del temor de Jehová. Now, I think there may be more. Yo creo que hay muchas más. But these are the ones that I found. Pero estas son las que yo encontré. Now, I'm not going to go over each one of those with no you. No voy a, a leerlas todas. We might be here till tomorrow morning that way. Tal vez nos quedemos hasta mañana por la mañana. But I want to say that in these applications of the fear of the Lord, pero si quiero decir que sobre estas aplicaciones del temor de Jehová, there is a repeated understanding hay un entendimiento repetitivo that God is asking us to fear Him for our benefit. Que Dios nos está pidiendo que le, que le temamos por el bien nuestro. It's, it's like a father appealing to a child saying, please don't do that. Do this. Es como el padre, eh, un padre rogándole a su hijo, por favor, no lo haga. And when I got done, I was so impressed by how my father. Cuando yo terminé estaba tan impresionado el, el saber cómo mi padre. Has thought through so many things to give us uh, an understanding as to what we should do. Es, uh, pensó de tantas cosas para que nosotros entendamos lo que tenemos que hacer. God gets into such detail. There's even a place where God says that when we eat at the table, Dios we're ha, just, go ahead. <laughs> Dios nos ha dado, I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Okay. The detail that God has gone into in the fear los of the Lord. Los detalles que Dios ha tenido para enseñarnos del temor de Jehová works all the way to the dinner table. But, se va todo hasta la mesa donde comemos. Because God says when we sit down to eat that we're to Porque, do it in the fear of the Lord. Porque Dios nos dice lo que debemos de hacer para comer antes de comer por el temor a Jehová. It's amazing. Esto es maravilloso. He tells us how we're to love one another, the kind of leaders we're to have, everything. He's He's taking care of the details. Él nos dice cómo debemos de amarnos unos a, lo, a los otros, cómo ser unos buenos líderes, y se va en tantos detalles que nos ha dado. In the past 30 years, por los últimos 30 años, within the church, en la iglesia, we have focused a lot on the love of God. Nos hemos enfocado bastante en el amor de Dios. But in 30 years, my friends, en 30 años, Amigos, I never heard one message on the fear of the Lord. Nunca he escuchado un mensaje sobre el temor a Jehová. And I say that without fear of contradiction by way of my history. Y digo esto para no contradecirme uh, lo, por mi historial que yo tengo. If you if you begin to teach a characteristic of God, si that tú empiezas is, that, Go ahead. Si tú empiezas a enseñar alguna car característica de Dios, and if it is out of balance, y si está fuera de balance, it can lead the listener into deception. Y puedes guiar a, al que te está escuchando en una decepción. People believe that God is a God of love. La gente cree que Dios es un Dios de amor. But they don't want to believe that He's also the Governor of the universe. Pero, el, pero no quieren creer que también es un Dios del universo. And so the challenge that we have so el reto que tenemos in living our life out 
en in uh, living vivir, vivir nuestra vida is that we've got to walk in the balance of that understanding. Es que tenemos que caminar en un balance de este entendimiento. And it's as simple as this. Es tan simple como esto. I love my father. Yo amo a mi padre. But my father is the ultimate authority. Pero mi padre es la autoridad última and o mayor. He, and just because he loves me, y nada más porque él me ama, doesn't mean I can get away with sinning. No quiere decir que yo voy a, a pecar. Because just like a good father, porque él todavía es un buen padre. I will be disciplined. Yo seré discipula, disciplinado. Book of Hebrews uh, uh, affirms that that he chastises those whom he loves. Porque dice la palabra que él castiga a los que él ama. And in that, my friends, I think we have a foundation that we can begin to build a y real... Con esto, amigos, creo que tenemos una uh, una base en que podemos fun, um, fi, um, uh, build... <laughs> right, build... Everybody. Build, una, una edificar nuestra creo que tenemos a, una base que podemos fundar en ella to build a really balanced para, relationship with our God para edificar una buena relación con Dios and to recognize him as our father reconocerlo como nuestro padre beyond just an intellectual understanding mucho más allá que nuestro intelecto but into a living reality en una verdadera realidad. If I was to go any further right now, I I wouldn't be able to stop for another hour or two. So I si think for tonight. I think for si, tonight. Si yo continúo en, con lo que sigue, yo me tendría que quedar alguna hora más. I hope that I have impressed upon you the love of our Father, but also the seriousness of our Father. Espero que haya impresionado en ti el amor de Dios, pero también la seriedad del amor de nuestro Padre. And also that we live in a time y that también que vivimos en un tiempo that desperately needs people que, des que desesperadamente necesitamos su amor who walk in a balanced relationship with our Father. y caminar en una relación balanceada con nuestra relación con el Padre. So again, I thank you, my friends, for letting me share with you. Otra vez te agradezco por, por dejarme compartir contigo. It is my prayer that it has encouraged you. Es mi oración que sea esto uh, anim, ánimo para ti. As well as challenged you. Y también como un, una, un reto. So thank you again for letting me be a part of your life today. Gracias por dejarme ser parte de tu vida hoy. Is there anybody that has a question or something that you'd like to uh, a comment? Oh, Lori, you have a question. Okay. Lori, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, Ed, I understand about the, you know, I thought the example of the woman who was caught in adultery is really good. And um, when Jesus says, go and sin no more, I think that, the problem that I have and where I get really uh, a lot of condemnation is that I do tend to sin again. And um, how do I how do I balance that out for 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 something that maybe you can't uh, seem to stop? Um, you know, the balance between the love of the Lord and His severity at the same time. You know, that's a good question. Um, I think that there's I think there's a couple of things to consider. Um, and it says, first of all, what Jesus was saying in the immediate context, and he was saying to that woman, stop the adultery. Don't do that again. Mm -hmm. in, in the broader context for you and I, it, if we come to a place where we feel like the Lord is saying, look, I don't condemn you, but don't do this again, mm -hmm. then normally with it, 
I believe the Holy Spirit wants to sh give us uh, revelation and understanding as to the next steps. This woman, it, historically, pe theologians believe that the woman that Jesus said this to in, in the temple is the same woman who would later wash his feet with her tears mm -hmm. and dry them, dry it with her hair. Now, what happened in that time frame must have been tremendous because the woman violated cultural norms by way of what was where Jesus was attending a dinner party, as it would be. Uh, she came in. She did everything that a woman was not supposed to do. On top of it, she was a woman who probably still dressed like an adulteress. And uh, it's, it's quite staggering to me that, that there is something that transpired because she was completely broken. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, I think there's a place where we can say, okay, if this is, if God is speaking this particular example to us, then we can go and say, Father, would you please take me to the place of brokenness? So that this sin will not be in this will not be an enticement to me any further. Mm -hmm. I think that's one thing. I think the other thing, though, that it could be as well, is that God may say, uh, "Lori, you need to be more accountable in this. Find somebody who's going to hold your feet to the fire to make sure that you don't do this again." Mm -hmm. So, I, those are two things I think of. I'm, because if we go into it and we think, well, I'm just going to do this again, then any repentance we have is going to be lacking. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be real repentance. And so our intent has got to be right from the get-go. God, I don't ever want this to happen again. Will it happen again? I don't know. It might. But I'm going to do everything in my power between prayer and being held accountable to make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps, but... Thank okay. you, Ed. It does. Okay. Um, is there somebody else that has a question or a comment or something you'd like to share? When the enemy the wants enemy to see us falling, uh, feeling like orphans, what should we do? Um, what should we do when we're when the enemy is trying to make us feel like an orphan? Well, the first thing, the first thing, I if if we recognize that it's from the enemy, then I need, I think we just need to tell him, hey, hey shut up. <laughs> I ask him because I have a teenager uh, kids and sometimes they feeling like um, nobody cares about them. So right. That's <laughs> it's very difficult for teenage kids because, man, they are really, really wrestling with their personal value. Yeah. And I think the biggest thing that we can do is to walk with those teenagers in saying to them, on the one hand, it's okay if you are wrestling with this, but it's not okay for you to believe a lie. And so the truth is this, you are loved, and you are cared for, and your Heavenly Father gave his son for you, and you need to hang on to that truth. And so I, I have personally found that communication with them, acknowledging that it's all right if they're struggling with those things, but it's not all right for them to believe those things. And that we get the chance to help them to understand what the truth is. And then perhaps if we pray effectively, and I think we can as parents or as friends, begin to pray that our Heavenly Father will bring a revelation of their value. Um, there, is, there is far more opportunity that God wants to take to bring revelation to the hearts of young people. He just wants to do it far more than we know. 
and he's looking for adults, whether parents or friends or aunts and uncles, whatever it may be, who will rise up and begin to pray and intercede and believe God for revelation for these kids. How's that sound? <laughs> Very good. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for your question. Um, okay, does anybody else have a question or a comment that you'd like to make? That's you, Alicia. Alicia, do you have a question or a comment? Well, a comment. Okay. I believe that, that we are being set free from the deception of the enemy so that we will be able to to set the other the younger ones free. Yeah. Amen. You know? I agree. So it, this is why this is important because a lot of us are still uh, wrestling with that, uh, the, the deceiving spirits of hell that try to, especially the intercessors, you know, they try to get you to, to, uh, to, to believe a lie, and then you, you just uh, don't do the, the work that God has cut out for you. Amen. Yeah. That's right, Alicia. Janie, do you have any questions or, or comments? Um, no, I just, well, I just wanted to comment. Um, you know, I myself have small children, and I'm glad that she asked that question because sometimes they they don't understand the love of the Father. But I also liked what Ed taught today was that they also need to understand the fear of the Father, which I've been trying to teach them, that, you know, when you sin, you repent and God forgives you, but also, and I gave the examples to her, like, um, I've been reading the book of John lately, and um, in, in the book of John, every single person that he healed, the, the message to them was, go and sin no more. Yep. And I'm trying to teach you. Now, there is there no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but also God expects you know, true true repentance that comes from the heart, when you truly repent and you mean it, you're not going to turn around and do the same thing anymore. Because it's like, right. think of it as another person. Like, like I told Janelle, my daughter, for example, I said, if, if you really knew that you did something that really hurt me and disappointed me, if you really meant it when you said you were sorry, you're not going to want to do it again because that love, that love is what keeps you from wanting to sin because you don't want to hurt me or disappoint me anymore. And I think when they understand that, like, like for instance, my daughter, when she was able to grasp and understand that, she was like, oh, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to try my hardest to never do that again. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. And, uh, and, like, as far as showing her the love of God, what I was explaining to her is, if you look in Philippians chapter 2, um, it says, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, who in being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself, noth but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So what I was explaining to her that, you know, he was... He has the same deity as God, but he laid that all down to be born as a human, to be born as a baby in the womb of a human. And then on top of doing this, he died, basically, he, he died a death on the cross, but not just any death, a death on a cross, which in those days was like, a, you know, with the robbers, thieves, things like that. So I was explaining to her, he loved us that much that he laid down his deity aside. Everything that he was, he laid it aside because he still is. That hasn't changed. But he chose to lay it down to become a human, first of all, then to go on a cross and die a sinner's death for us. And when she understood it that way, it's like, um, 
you know, it can bring tears to your eyes because you realize how much he loves us, but also how much in return we should love him and 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 want to serve and honor him because we're called to serve just as he served. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I kept right, going Jenny. on too far. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janie, for sharing. That was a blessing. Thank you, honey. <laughs> 